This is CBC Here and Now. Well, it's a big night in Portugal Cove St. Phillips as teams are vying for the Killick Coast Games Championships and embracing the fun that comes along with some friendly competition. Here now is Jeremy Eaton is there live. Well, we're just waiting for the opening kickoff here, Carolyn, and two teams actually from Logie Bay, Middle Cove, and Outer Cove are set to square off to try to see who is the best soccer playing team in this region. But first, let's throw it back to you with the news of the day. Thanks, Jeremy. Well, when it comes to defensive driving, there's so much to watch out for on our province's roads. Changing weather, road conditions, other drivers, not to mention moose. Here now as Meg Roberts joins me now with a jarring dash cam video which captures the moment leading up to a crash. So Meg, what can you tell us about this video? Well, first, I would like to warn viewers that this is a video of a highway accident but it shows the reality of just how quickly a moose can wander onto the road and how even on clear summer days they can appear seemingly out of nowhere. Good road conditions, no distractions, even driving under the speed limit and still an accident can happen just like that. The video sent to CBC News is a disturbing reminder to drivers. The moose, tough to see, quickly darts out in front of the vehicle and within two seconds smashes into the windshield. Amazingly, the driver wasn't injured. It's a hair-raising situation that makes any driver uneasy. I was just wondering if you would mind taking a look at a video and just telling me what you think about it. Oh, it's not much you can do there in that case. Yeah, that's just a case there where it's absolutely nothing can do. He wasn't going fast, he was. He could see, but the moose just shot up in front of him. Just one of those things. Oh gosh. <laughs> what do you think? Oh, just, I guess it just kind of shows you how fast it can happen. Wow, that's fast. Yeah. yeah, they come up on the road pretty quick, eh? Yeah, what do you think of that? Well, you don't have a chance. Yeah. yeah, there's not much you can do when a moose jumps out in front of you. Yeah. Just run into it. And while moose collisions are often hard to avoid, there are some things you can do. Jim Brazel is a defensive driving instructor, and I caught a ride for some tips. So one of the things we will advise our students to do is, is drop back their speed. And the reason for that, two things. The force of impact gets greatly reduced because of the kinetic energy being reduced in that vehicle. And also your peripheral vision gets stronger with a reduced speed. What I always say to people, if I'm driving nighttime especially, you have two lanes here. What I'm going to try to do as a driver, especially if I'm not impeding anybody, is actually get towards the center because it provides you now with more space from the side. Yeah, Meg, that is such a startling video. And uh, do you have any safety tips for drivers on the highway? Well, being from Southern Ontario, moose accidents are very new to me. So I learned a lot. Now, Brazel says you have to scan both sides of the road and where possible, keep those high beams on. If you notice a break in headlights of oncoming traffic, that could be a moose. And some can be eager to pass a transport truck on the highway. But if you actually slow down and stay a safe distance behind, it, that truck could offer you some protection. Now, most importantly, Brazel says drivers should stay alert. Some excellent tips there for sure. Thank you so much, Meg. You're welcome. Well, have you had a close call and caught it on camera? If you have, let us know about it. You can email us at hereandnow.nl at cbc.ca or send us a message on Facebook. You can also reach us on Twitter at CBCNL. Well, Newfoundland and Labrador Biotech Company has announced details of a multi-million dollar genetic research project it promises will bring investment to this province and result in better treatments for diseases afflicting people here. But first, Sequence Bio is looking for 2,500 people on the island to share their genetic and medical information. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. Really really excited. It's a big day for an ambitious Newfoundland company that's attracted several millions of dollars from as far away as California's Silicon Valley. 
having the team and the technology in place and the approvals necessary to launch this project is one of the greatest accomplishments of my whole life. Now the company's CEO says Sequence Bio can finally do what it's been talking about since it was founded six years ago studying the genetic information of people in this province to find potentially lucrative treatments. We are looking for drug targets, meaning if we can, in aggregate, identify particular changes to the genetic code that can be treated with the drug, that's what we contribute to. And this is, a, this is an industry that's global. But it hasn't been easy getting here. Twice before, the province's Health Research Ethics Board rejected the company's research proposals. Last year, Sequence Bio launched an aggressive legal challenge of the process. And now, Gardner says Sequence Bio will have to earn people's trust. We firmly believe that participants own their data, and at any time they can withdraw from this project, and all that data will be deleted. Here at Munn School of Medicine, health experts say proceed, but with caution. They say Sequence Bio may be doing all the right things. But they also warn there has been unethical research in this province in the past. Our most famous example or infamous example, I suppose, is, is what's been uh, come to be called the Texas Vampires. As Pullman explains, the vampires were U.S. researchers who collected blood samples from people in this province but never shared what they found. Pullman isn't suggesting this is what Sequence Bio will do, but he's urging anyone who's considering sharing their genetic information to be very careful. Fifteen years ago, we were called geno hype. You know, the idea that you know, now we've got your genes. Uh, now we're going to solve all your health problems. You know, uh, be very careful. Gardner promises Sequence Bio isn't a storefront operation that will turn around and sell genetic information to the highest bidder. He says the company hopes to collaborate with publicly funded institutions like Munn to help the residents of this province. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. can feel the heaviness in the air today with temperatures sitting in the 20 degree range for most areas a little cooler down through Port of Basque at 17 degrees and then along the northeast coast as well 18 was the afternoon high in St. Anthony if we take a look at the satellite radar picture right now uh, we are starting to see it we're seeing a cold front push through up uh, into Labrador and that's sparking some lightning that continues as we head through the night tonight if we zoom in a little bit we can see some clearing skies for the metro area. Don't let that fool you though. We've got some showers on the way as we head through the night. I'll have all the details coming up. It's costing us money. The parking is costing us millions of dollars. Vandals have had the upper hand when it comes to downtown parking meters, but has City Hall found a fix? That's ahead. A new group in St. John's is hoping to improve the lives of Indigenous people living in the city. The St. John's Urban Indigenous Coalition had its first meeting today. The group aims to bring several existing outreach groups together under one umbrella. It will be looking at how to improve things like health care, housing and access to services for city dwelling Indigenous people, a booming demographic. One of the biggest trends lately is that the indigenous population in the metro region has more than doubled in about the last 10 years. That's leading the entire country in terms of, in terms of that trend. So We're learning more about a pair of $10 million deals Nalcor has made with two indigenous groups in Labrador. The money was set aside for work at Muskrat Falls to mitigate the risk of methyl mercury contamination. But the deadline passed to get the work done, and so the Crown Corporation is giving the money away with a few strings attached. Bailey White reports. The agreement Nalcor made with the Nunatuavut Community Council is fewer than 300 words long. It says the Crown Corporation will give Nunatuavut $10 million and Nunatuavut will spend that money on health and social programs. It doesn't specify what those programs might look like. Well, the agreement is a very simple agreement. Uh, our only commitment to use these funds is for the betterment of our people and communities. Nunatuavut President Todd Russell says he's long been concerned about methylmercury in the Muskrat Falls Reservoir, but he says new data shows the levels didn't rise during initial flooding. We were presented with an opportunity to, to have some additional resources. Uh, significant uh, resources go into our organization to help our people. Those funds were better utilized within NCC than left with NELCOR. 
Inunation has also signed a $10 million deal with Nalcor. Unatsiavut has not. The Inuit government still wants the province to mitigate methylmercury risks. Bailey White, CBC News, St. John's. The Offshore Petroleum Board has released another photo showing the oil spill from Hibernia. Hibernia spilled about 12,000 liters of an oil and water mixture last Wednesday. Oil production has been halted ever since. The CNLOPB released this photo this afternoon showing several vessels helping with the cleanup. The Offshore Petroleum Board says a surveillance flight yesterday shows the oil sheen has broken into at least two separate regions. It says extra surveillance flights are set for today. So far, four birds have been spotted with oil on them and taken to shore to be cleaned. This photo from last week shows the oil sheen in the early stages before it spread out. The board says some of the oil has been recovered while some would have evaporated or dispersed. The Hibernia Management and Development Company says there are six vessels in the area today helping with the cleanup. The search for unexploded artillery shells in the waters off Bell Island is over for now. Crews with the Department of National Defense spent a couple of weeks combining four shipwrecks in Conception Bay. These iron ore boats were sunk during World War II and went down with some explosive items on board. DND says divers recovered 82 unexploded ordnance and two boxes of bullets. The items were taken to Mackesons and blown up. DND says the job is only half finished and crews will be back in the future to recover more. The well, city of St. John's is putting an end to decapitated parking meters. Vandals have been taking the tops off meters for years, but today councillors voted for a possible fix. Here are now's Katie Breen reports. Not an uncommon sight in St. John's. Headless meters sit on stumps just about everywhere. The city tried staying on top of it, but repairing meters is expensive, and councillors say it just wasn't worth the cost when people would come behind and break them again just as soon as they'd been fixed. We have 1,167 meters, and I think half of them are not operational. So no, we're nowhere near getting back the revenue. It's costing us money. The parking is costing us millions of dollars. That's when this app was brought in. The city introduced a pay-by-phone system about a year ago here downtown. It wanted to test it out, see if it could replace the meters. Today at the Committee of the Whole meeting, councillors talked about public feedback. They said people were concerned about going app only. Some people just didn't want to use their phones. Others said they weren't smartphone savvy and wanted to be able to pay another way. So councillors decided on a mixed approach. Keep the app, but also install pay stations, like little kiosks where people could use a credit card or maybe even a debit. RFPs have gone out. The city says it's getting some proposals, but it hasn't chosen a winner yet. Once it does, the app and the pay stations will start spreading around the city. It'll start off downtown in the fall and then eventually work its way around. Maybe even end up here. That would be the plan, yes, to move it to, to, to offer multi-platforms for people to park in our city to make it easy is the ultimate goal for us. Not, it's not the, it's not the revenue generation is, is great, but that's not it at all. Our main goal is to make parking accessible and easy for the people of the city of St. John's and people that visit here. So, the best of both worlds, an app and a way to pay without a phone. But no cash. These new pay stations aren't going to take coin for at least a year. That's because the city doesn't want people to come and take the top off their new pay stations too. Katie Breen, CBC News, St. John's. Well, that's a live look at St. John's Harbor from the camera at the Rose. Yeah, right now it's looking a little cloudy, but there are some clearing skies in the forecast, but some rain as well. I'll have your full forecast coming up.
Welcome back, everyone. And Ashley, you were mentioning earlier about the humidity, and boy, I really felt that today. Yeah, it feels thick. Yeah. The air feels thick. Mm. I miss that. I haven't felt uh, humidity in a long time. Yeah, it's bad <laughs> for the frizzies. Yes, it's not so good on our hair, no. <laughs> yeah, but before we get to the weather, uh, we're going to take you swimming with the fishes. All right. Yes, here's an underwater look at uh, some codfish and capelin at Middle Cove near St. John's. Oh, wow, Great look at that. video. So that's what it looks like when I go fishing. Yeah, under the water. How cool is that? This was taken last Thursday, uh, but sent to us this week. Oh, that's so great. great. video. It, yeah, I went fishing on Sunday too, and uh, the capelin were right under the boat. So it's really? Kinda, yeah, you saw them like a yeah, big, school a big school of them, of them go them. by? And I'd never seen that before. It was really cool. Yeah. So there you go. That's what it looks like. Thank you very much, Brandon, mm -hmm. for uh, sending that to us. Gorgeous video. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, lots of people fishing on the weekend and mm -hmm. this coming weekend, too, for sure. Yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, the good news is it's going to get warmer and warmer. Oh, so, good. Yeah. That's finally, uh, finally feels like summer a little bit, especially yeah. with the humidity in the air. But uh, temperatures right now uh, sitting around 18 degrees, 21 for Badger, and then up through Labrador, 20 degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay. And uh, as far as that satellite radar picture goes, we are seeing a few showers for parts of the northern peninsula, and then we're starting to see some showers just offshore right now. And if we zoom in a little bit, we can see some clearing skies. So that's going to happen for the next couple of hours, more than likely. And then as we head through the night tonight, the next round of showers will move in pretty similar to what we saw last night as far as that track goes, but they're a little later. By now, we had already seen those showers. So tonight after midnight, that's when they're going to start to move further north. Heavy at times as well. Could see about 10, maybe 15 millimeters of rain with this system as it moves by. Uh, we're looking at pretty mild temperatures as well, anywhere from 10 to 14 degrees, a little cooler up through St. Anthony at nine degrees. Those winds around uh, 10 to 15 kilometers per hour, maybe as high as 20 for uh, the northeast coast out of the west, and then light winds for the uh, west coast. Now, as far as Labrador goes, the next couple of hours, we're still looking at that risk of some lightning, especially for the southeast coast. Uh, we're looking at 11 degrees for Cartwright tonight, light winds. Uh, same for Happy Valley Goose Bay, a little cooler up through Nain, only uh, sitting around 8 degrees. That's where you sat for most of the day. Not really going to move much. You'll see your warm-up up tomorrow and then Lab City sitting at nine degrees overnight tonight. Those winds will eventually ease. So once that low moves off by mid morning tomorrow, it does look like things should stay cloudy. Few peaks of sun, a lot less sun than we saw today, but still looking at that uh, potential for some showers into the afternoon, more of a, a pop up scattered shower scenario. Uh, Northern Peninsula could see more sunshine and then generally clearing out up through uh, Labrador. Uh, more sunshine than what we're seeing today with the chance of some scattered pop up showers as well in the mix and maybe even a few rumbles of thunder generally uh, to the north uh, for Labrador. So here's a look at your temperatures a little cooler than what we saw today, somewhere between uh, 15, maybe 16 degrees for the south coast of uh, the Avalon, 18 degrees for St. John's as we head a little bit further inland. Clarenville sitting at 23, 20 degrees is your afternoon high for uh, Marystown. And then we're looking at 24, 25 degrees towards Grand Falls, Windsor. Again, a mix of sun and cloud and the slight chance of a pop up afternoon thunder shower, uh, rather shower. And then 17 degrees for Harbor Breton along the coast. Port of Basque, 19, plenty of sunshine. And then again, that chance of showers right up through to Gross Moor. 20 degrees should be your afternoon high. And then warmer for St. Anthony as well, reaching a high near 21. 24 for Cartwright. Again, the chance of some uh, thunder showers up through Makovic, maybe even Nain there. Eight, uh, 15 degrees tomorrow, so much nicer than what we saw today. Those winds shifting from northwest to southwest, hence that warm up. And then Churchill Falls, 17 degrees, same for Lab City with that chance of shower. So that's a look at your forecast for tomorrow. We're getting closer and closer to the weekend, and that's when that push of warm air is moving in. So I'll certainly have those details coming back. But I'm going to hand things off now to Jeremy Eaton in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips. Jeremy, what's the weather out there right now? Are you seeing any sunshine? 
Well, not right now, actually, but earlier today, many people here were singing your praises because they thought today was going to be a day filled with rain. But when I was here earlier today, there was a lot of sunshine. It's clouded over now, but as you can see here is Mike Penn's across. There is the championship soccer game for senior soccer. This is mixed soccer, and it's actually two teams from Logie Bay, Middle Cove, and Outer Cove playing against each other. And we're here because it's the Killick Coast Games. And I believe from the people I've talked to today, it's the 13th year that this event has been coming down, been going on. I'd, I'd say there's no flies on us, but there's lots of flies on us right now. And it's probably because of the product in my hair. Now this event features young athletes between the ages of 11 and 17 from the communities of Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, Torbay, Baleen, Flat Rock, Pooch Cove, Logie Bay, Outer Cove, and sorry, Logie Bay, Middle Cove, and Outer Cove. Now there's about 600 of these athletes taking part in these games in which they play five sports. Soccer, as you can see right now, they also play ball hockey, basketball, softball, and cross country running. But nobody cares what I have to say about anything. But earlier today when I was here, when it was nice and sunny, I spoke with a number of the athletes and here's their take on how this Killick Coast Games is going. Oh, it's probably my favorite part of the summer. Why is that, huh? Uh, just being with everyone from town and just celebrating sports that I love to play and it's just a fun time. It's just like a week and we get to spend it with our friends and it's really fun. I know, just like ripping up with the boys. <laughs> oh, it's great, I love it. What do you love about it? Um, you know, there's a bit of competition, you know, but it's all just fun and games. What sports did you take part in this week? Uh, cross country, basketball, softball, and soccer. You did four of the five. How hard was that on you? Um, not that hard because there, I only have one. The cross country thing was today, and a lot of the sports were on Sunday, so it wasn't that hard. Yeah, it means a lot, actually, just play for my town and have like my little logo on my shirt and to know like I'm here to play and have fun. I, I ran cross country this morning and I came first. How did it feel to win that event? Very good. Really fun. I like playing a lot of sports. Is this the first time you've done it? Yeah. And your first time, is this something you'd like to do again? Yes. I think I would definitely like to do them again next year and I will recommend them to anybody who likes to play sports and all that. So as you can see, it's a little fast-paced soccer action going on here in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips. They've had a fun week. It's been going on since the 21st of July, and it'll wrap up tomorrow. So, uh, but we are going to talk to one of the organizers from the town of Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, to learn a little bit more about how important this game, these games are to young people and their sports development. Reporting live for here and now, I'm Jeremy Eaton in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips.
Welcome back to Here and Now. To a northern Ontario community now where First Nation continues its long-standing fight for safe drinking water. Earlier this month, the fly-in community of Attawapiskat declared a state of emergency. Yesterday, many community members marched to highlight their concerns. Jorge Barrera reports. <laughs> About 50 Attawapiskat community members led by women and children marched to the band office demanding a final and immediate fix to their water woes. They say they are tired of band-aid solutions that simply push the issue down the line. Now this march comes as officials with Indigenous Services Canada arrived in the community to put in stopgap measures to allow people to have clean water. It's so slow right now, really, really slow. I'm very disappointed as a councillor for myself. And I also feel very ashamed being a cancer because I know I'm a mother too. For my children, I guess um, they're getting infections, skin irritations from the tap water. Well, I would like to see clean water and housing and other good stuff that everybody's entitled to in Canada. Now this issue all blew up after water tests came back showing there were elevated levels of a chemical byproduct caused by the chlorination process in their tap water. Those same water tests also show increased levels of the same byproduct in the community drinking water, which comes from two watering stations in the community. Now, the marchers went to the band office and confronted the chief, Ignace Gull, saying they were tired of these band-aid solutions and they wanted a fix now. Indigenous Services Minister Seamus O'Regan has said the community is going to get a new water treatment plant, but people here are waiting to see the results of those words. Jorge Barrera, CBC News, out of Wapiska. A missed connection in Montreal took an uncomfortable turn for a 71-year-old woman. Her flight from Ottawa was delayed, which meant she couldn't catch her connection to Paris. Air Canada offered to put her up in a hotel, but as the CBC's Robin Miller reports, there was a catch. Jérine Mihaly Nyota is doing what she can to try and relax. It's been a stressful weekend. Well, when I found out, I thought, is it a joke? Or is it like, uh, what's going on, you know? Like, why, who does that, you know? Who does that? Her 71-year-old mother was set to fly back to Paris from Ottawa last Friday. But when a delay forced her to miss a connection, she was offered a hotel room in Montreal with another passenger. He was a complete stranger, a man half her age. When the uh, Air Canada agent uh, told her, okay, we just have one room available and you will share with this, with this guy, the guy also was shocked, was hit, but I don't know her. <laughs> My mom said, I don't know the guy. After hours on the phone with Air Canada, Mihailin Yoda says the airline did find her mother a room at another hotel, but she worries about what could have happened if she didn't intervene. I think it's not fair, you know, with people who are vulnerable, you know, that things like that happen because they are depending, you know, on someone, you know, to take care of them. Air Canada says it's not their policy to have passengers not traveling together share a room. In a written statement, a spokesperson said, in this case, an error was initially made due to a misunderstanding. After this was realized, the customer was provided a separate room and we have followed up to apologize for the mix-up. Ariel Roy works for a law firm that defends passenger rights. She says the family should fight for compensation. Oh, it's not something that uh, would happen often, but it's sure that uh, one time it's one time too many. Mihaly Yoda says she's filed a formal complaint because the whole experience has really taken a toll on her mother. She used to visit Ottawa almost every year and always flew Air Canada. Now she says her mom is nervous to fly by herself again. Robin Miller, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, July marks Pride Month in Newfoundland and Labrador. As part of Pride, CBC sat down with some members of the local LGBTQ community to share their coming out stories. Here are three of those stories. Hi, um, my name is Sarah Dina Hernam. So I'm Shramona and I come from India. My name is Pamela Shaves. I am a trans woman, I'm a queer woman, and this is kind of my story, I guess. I began to hide because I knew from that day on that I was different, that I wasn't like them. All right? And as time progressed, I went from just being different and couldn't tell to being 
in my own voice, uh, a freak, uh, a fetish, you know, those kind, all those things. And in my 40s, after my divorce, which was unrelated to my sexuality or gender, I finally came to terms with being a woman trapped in a body that didn't belong to me or wasn't appropriate for me. And then I started taking steps to make it, make it happen. I looked after uh, my mother um, for 11 years with um, complex medical issues and dementia. And uh, during the, these 11 years, I had come out to myself. I had accepted the fact that uh, I wasn't happy um, and I wasn't being my true self. Um, unfortunately, looking after a dementia patient, you can't really come out to a dementia patient. It would be a matter of coming out every day, which would be way too stressful on anyone to, to tolerate. Having a gay child is not a failure. You fail as a parent when you disown, when you don't accept your child. My closest friends were very supportive of me, um, but my other the other people around me like if word got around then they'd be like you're not attracted to women you've had heterosexual like relationships and you're just doing this for the attention if i had never come out i wouldn't have been able to find myself and find that confidence in me because once i came out not only did i become more confident about talking about such topics but I was more receptive to other ideas. I was reborn because all of a sudden I no longer had to hide anything. You can watch or re-watch anything you see on Here and Now anytime, anywhere. Just go to YouTube and subscribe to CBCNL. Lots of fun being had here out on the field in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips. It's the Killick Coast Games, and we're going to learn a lot more about that event, this event, sorry, coming up. Well, welcome back to Here Now. I'm Jeremy Eaton hanging out on the field here in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips. It's the Killick Coast Games. 
which I've learned a lot about today, and I'm about to learn a lot more thanks to this, our, our guest right here, Nick Miller with the town of Portugal Coast St. Phillips. He's the sports coordinator, and I believe somebody has just scored a goal here behind us. That's why there's been a little bit of clapping and cheering in the background. Nick, uh, for people who don't know, what are the Killick Coast Games? Um, so the Killick Coast Games, uh, it's the 13th annual Killick Coast Games, actually. The games were brought in basically for a friendly competition between six different communities. So we have the town of Tor Bay, Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, Logan Bay, Middle Cove, Outer Cove, Bali and Pooch Cove and Flat Rock. And yeah, it's, it happens every summer. Um, it rotates hosts between towns. Um, we have five different sports. So the five different sports are softball, soccer, uh, ball hockey, cross country running, and basketball. And, what's, and behind us now, this is the championship, but yeah. I noticed that there's uh, young men and young women playing together. How does that work? Um, so we have co-ed divisions as well as boys and girls divisions. Um, our co-ed divisions are soccer and ball hockey. And we have ages 11 to 17 um, with two tier groups, 11 to 13 and 14 to 17. So I was here earlier today and there was a ton of activity around here at, uh, at the park here. Yeah. How many uh, kids are involved? How many young people are involved? And how many coaches take to pull this off? Um, so this year we have 715 athletes and coaches. Um, it's the biggest year yet. <laughs> it's a lot of people to look after the schedule, the feed, um, but we are very happy to host it in the town of Portugal Coast, St. Phillips. And we're very grateful for all the coaches to come out and volunteer. Uh, without volunteers, we would not be able to make this possible. Now, you and I were chatting earlier. You're a sports guy. I'm a little bit of a sports guy. <laughs> but uh, it's important. I know it's a really hot topic now to get young people involved into athletics. So all the people here on the field, they're not all like soccer players. They're first-timers. How does it work with this event? Um, so basically, the event is free. Um, and kids can register up to three sports. So they can choose any three out of the five that they want to do. And basically, you don't have to have any experience. Um, you can just come out and play. And that's what it was really meant for, was to get kids out and active. Kids who might not have never played basketball before can come out and play basketball. Um, kids who have never played soccer can come out and play soccer. Um, and that's what we really wanted to do, was just get kids out and active, enjoying the summer. And to be honest with you, a lot of kids will come up to you after the week and tell you that this is their favorite part of the summer. As a sports guy, as a sports coordinator yeah. for the town of Portugal, Cold St. Phillips, how does that make you feel? It's, it makes me feel really good. Um, I love seeing kids out and active. Um, we're all about, especially with the town of Portugal Coast St. Phillips and all as well as the other communities, about getting kids out, being active. Uh, I know healthy eating is a big, uh, big thing nowadays, as well as we do with our canteen. We offer uh, free meals for the kids all week, and we have uh, very healthy options for them to enjoy and just to be active. Well, uh, Nick, appreciate your time, and thanks so much for uh, telling us about this event. And uh, I hope Logie Bay, Middle Cove, Outer Cove wins because <laughs> yeah. they seem to be playing themselves. Yeah. But uh, thanks so much for your time, Thank man. We appreciate it. Out. Thanks for letting us yeah, hang out. So, Carolyn, uh, I've been hanging out here uh, all day. This is the second last day of competition. Tomorrow there's a little bit more competition, and then they're going to have the closing ceremonies, and then uh, all this fun will sort of uh, come to an end. Okay, Jeremy. Thank you so much. Looking great out there. Thank you. <laughs> Well, speaking of games, the Olympic countdown has started. It's one year until the next summer games officially open in Tokyo. Three, two, Tokyo, 2020. A digital clock set up in the middle of the city today started the countdown to July 2020. It will be the fourth time the country has hosted the Olympics. And no wonder, with 35 million people, Greater Tokyo is the most populated region in the world. Already, ticket sales have been exceptional. New summer sports include karate, skateboarding and surfing. Well, Boris Johnson is officially Britain's prime minister, and he's already getting a cabinet together. Today, on the steps of his new residence, 10 Downing Street, Johnson said the doubters and critics of Brexit will be proven wrong. The people who bet against Britain are going to lose their shirts, and we're going to fulfill the repeated promises of Parliament to the people and come out of the EU on October the 31st. No ifs. Or butts. 
Now, before delivering that speech, Johnson had to go to Buckingham Palace, where the Queen invited him to form a government, and he accepted. As Theresa May left Downing, she wish wished Johnson and his government, quote, every good fortune. Well, an area in northern Manitoba is the latest focus of a national manhunt for two young men from B.C. The duo are suspects in the fatal shooting of an Australian man and his gr American girlfriend. They are also linked to the suspicious death of another man whose body was found several hundred kilometers away. Renee Filipponi has the latest. Their faces have been plastered on TV screens for days. 19-year-old Cam McLeod and 18-year-old Briar Schmigelski are still on the run and considered dangerous. You know, these suspects are young, and I think it's very important to realize that they're supporting each other. They're running scared. Uh, they don't know what's going to happen. While police search for the pair, they're also involved in investigating multiple crime scenes across B.C., looking for evidence, trying to piece together what happened and how three people ended up dead. When violent incidents occur, we take it very, very seriously and we take all the necessary steps with the police and otherwise. The teens are wanted in the shooting murder of a young couple whose bodies were found on the side of the Alaska Highway south of Laird Hot Springs on July 15th. They've also been connected to a second crime scene more than 450 kilometers away where Schmigelski's burnt out truck was found close to the body of an unidentified man. The pair have since been cited driving a 2011 Toyota RAV4 through northern Saskatchewan and northern Manitoba. That vehicle was found burned out on a stretch of highway near Gillum. Based on this information, we have sent a number of resources to the Gillum area. There will be a heavier police presence in the community. Tensions are high in the Manitoba community where they were spotted. People are being told to stay indoors and not to travel anywhere alone. Well, I can totally understand uh, that they might be anxious. Uh, I am as well, because uh, it's an unknown. We don't know what's happening right now. We don't know where they are. In the teen's hometown of Port Alberni, people who knew the suspects are in shock. My heart is just breaking for all the families. And uh, it'd just be nice if we could get some answers uh, to what's happening and find these kids and just get some closure. A statement from Cam McLeod's father reads in part, Cam is a kind, considerate, caring young man, always has been concerned about other people's feelings. As we try to wrap our heads around what is happening and hope that Cam will come home to us safely so we can all get to the bottom of this story. Police continue to warn people, if you see the pair, don't approach them. Call 911 immediately. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver.
Welcome back, everyone. Well, Ashley, you mentioned a bit earlier about some warmer temperatures starting to come through as the week uh, continues on. That's right. Uh, tell us more about that. <laughs> I know everybody wants to know where summer is. It has mm. been uh, a little chilly for parts of the uh, province. Others seeing uh, quite nice temperatures, but we'll take a look at tomorrow's forecast. That's where we're going to start to see this warmer air push in. Grand Falls winds are seeing a high near 25 degrees tomorrow. Uh, St. John's still staying a little cooler at 18 degrees with that chance of showers and then up through Labrador as well. Happy Valley Goose Bay, 23 degrees, 17 for Lab City and then Nain finally going to essentially double what your temperature was today sitting around 15 tomorrow afternoon. Now a couple of systems in play again, pretty much the same uh, trend as what we've been seeing for the last couple of days. We've got a number of low pressure systems with this moist southerly flow uh, in behind that. There's the next weather maker. We've got two areas of high pressure one to the east and one to the west and that's what's allowing the jet stream to uh, continue this flow that moist southerly flow and with that we're going to see a big push of warm air so this is the upper level in the atmosphere and when we start to see that ridging in the atmosphere when you see this big push we're going to start to see that push of warm air so that's going to move in for most of the weekend and then eventually uh, those temperatures are actually going to stay quite uh, similar. So by the time Friday rolls around, it does look like sunshine in the forecast as well. Uh, 26 degrees for Grand Falls, Windsor, 24 for Corner Brook. Still hanging on to the mid to high teens for the Avalon. That will change though. We're certainly going to see those warmer temperatures. 24 already by the time Friday rolls around for St. Anthony. 25 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Cartwright sitting around 24 as well. And then similar temperature for Lab City. Again, with plenty of sunshine. So over the next couple of days, we will eventually get there because here's what it's looking like. By the time we hit Friday, uh, or rather Saturday, sunshine 23 degrees. Again, it's going to be pretty humid as far as uh, that goes. And then Sunday and Monday still looking like plenty of sunshine, 24 and 25 degrees. Those overnight lows in the double digits around 16 degrees for Sunday and then Monday uh, going down to about 13 degrees into the evening hours. Now for central Newfoundland, that push of warm air moving in a little bit sooner. So 25 tomorrow, Friday feeling uh, or rather temperature near 26 degrees as we head into Sunday. That's when the next chance of rain moves in. Uh, still looking at plenty of sunshine though through the day with those pop up showers and then Monday 28 degrees. So definitely looks like summer is uh, here finally at the end of July. But uh, Western Newfoundland 23 degrees on your Thursday, Friday and then heading towards the weekend. That's when we'll start to see those temperatures climb 28 for Sunday and then Monday looking at 26 degrees. Now for Eastern Labrador, these temperatures as well might even reach the 30 degree mark by Saturday, but still have it in the high 20s. Uh, with that unsettled weather, so a little bit of a low pressure systems moving through chance of showers essentially through Monday, but uh, we'll take it with those warmer temperatures for sure. And then for Western Labrador, 17 degrees tomorrow and then that warm up moves in Friday sitting at 24 degrees and then Saturday 26 and then to round out the weekend in the low 20s. I want to know where you're to. Larry Jenkins sent me this photo. Can you see the face in the clouds there? Ooh, scary face. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Take a guess where this is to, and I'll let you know after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now. A street festival in Belgium is bringing art to life this summer. For me, it's really amazing. A lot of statues are really interesting. Uh, a lot of them are really interesting and beautiful. More than 100 artists are participating, making it the largest living statue festival in Europe. That's so cool. Look at that. About 50,000 visitors have shown up. And unlike frozen statues in many cities, these artists are interacting, you can see, with the crowds. That is very cool. It's so interesting. They always creep me out a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of the stuff of nightmares. <laughs> Just a little bit. You do have a point. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that looks pretty cool, though. That is cool. <laughs> All right, we're going to head back uh, to check in with uh, Jeremy Eaton, who's at Rainbow Gully Park in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips. So, Jeremy, how's that uh, championship game going behind you? Is it finished up yet? I, when you guys were talking about cool, I was like, speaking of cool, let's go to Jeremy Eaton there in Portugal <laughs> Cove, St. Phillips. Um, uh, yeah, totally the game good, is just wrapped up, but... <laughs> That would have been all. That would have been okay. Uh, so uh, obviously, Logie Bay, Middle Cove, Outer Cove played against Logie Bay, Middle Cove, Outer Cove. So Logie Bay, Middle Cove, Outer Cove won this round. But all hands uh, had a lot of fun. Uh, they just did a photo shoot. But I just heard from one of the moms that a lot of these players will now leave here and they'll go over and play in the softball championship game. And that's part of the fun of the Killick Games. And I've had a ton of fun down here tonight activity out there for sure and uh, we've been having a lot of fun trying to figure out like where you're going to be every night. Uh, what are your plans for tomorrow? It's like I'm a poor man's Carmen San Diego. <laughs> um, tomorrow night uh, we're going to check in with a group called Camp Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's obviously a camp which it's called Camp Hollywood, which probably involves a little bit of acting. And Carolyn, nobody knows that I used to be a thespian. Really? Not a very good one. But I, I was an actor that. in the 1990s. <laughs> I, like I said, I wasn't very good. I'd never get cast on Republic of Doyle. That's for sure. <laughs> awesome. Anyway, so, uh, so, tune in, so tune in tomorrow night and you might see me box step. Who's to say? <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Looking forward to that. We have to like rebrand Where's Waldo to Where's Jeremy, I think, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> All right. So now we get to find out more about that uh, interesting weather picture that you put up that yeah. kind of looks like that uh, painting the screen. The screen, that's exactly what I thought when mm -hmm. I first saw it. Take a look at uh, our weather photo of the day today and uh, you can kind of see that uh, face in the clouds there. Or an alien. Or an alien, something like head. that. <laughs> Beautiful, any idea where that was taken? No clue. Can't tell, hey? No. It's taken in Lab City. Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a great shot, thank you. Uh, for sending that weather photo in, Larry Jenkins. Uh, and if you have any weather photos that you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Mm -hmm. And we'll try and get them on the show for you. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Really looking forward to seeing Jeremy at that Camp Hollywood tomorrow night. I know. I Well, he was just saying that they're going to play softball. I would like to go uh, join them for that, that yeah. would be fun. <laughs> it's a pretty good night for it out it's there. It's a beautiful it night, seems. yeah, especially if those skies clear, like uh, it looks like it's going to, but overnight tonight, we are looking at that chance of showers moving in. Could see about 10, maybe 20 mils of rain. Okay. It's, yeah. Alrighty, good for the plants. Yes, absolutely. Not great for walking, although I did see a lot of runners out uh, in the rain last night, mm -hmm. so it doesn't stop people from getting outdoors, that's for sure. Well, if the weather stopped you, you'd never do anything That's here, right, so. <laughs> good point. <laughs> well, thank you so much for uh, spending part of your evening Evening with us. That's it for this edition of Here and Now. Hope to see you tomorrow night. Good night.